Hello and happy Friday. Welcome to the Waitlist Guest Expert Series. If you noticed, I took a break from these expert interviews over the summer and I re-released our past year's worth of interviews. I can't believe it's been a full year. But today I would really love to introduce you to Carissa Lynn Renner. Hi, Carissa. Hi. We are so excited to hear about how to own our voices like a siren, and Carissa has a background of being a singer. Before we jump into her and how she's going to give us some beautiful gifts this morning, she has a wonderful meditation for us. I'd love to let you know that if you are joining us live today, please say hi in the comments. There is a link to click from StreamYard so that I can see your name and I will be monitoring the chat, but we would love to say hi back to you. Uh, this interview will happen for about 30 to 45 minutes. So if you're joining us a little bit late, there's no late to this party. You can still join and comment as much as you would like. Also, the replay for this particular interview will be up through the weekend. So if you're a weekend warrior and you like to catch up on the weekend, we got you. And you can still listen to this and tag Carissa with your questions. If you don't tag her, I will make sure she gets in front of your questions or your concerns so that we can make sure you are using your voice like a wonderful siren that you are. <laughs> awesome. So um, how are you doing this morning, Carissa? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for asking. And by the way, I love when people sing talk like you just did. You sing your voice. It's my favorite when people, first of all, it, it brings you just so much joy. And because it lets me know people are just having fun and they're playing and they're, they're um, relaxed. Like you would only do that when you're feeling pretty confident and relaxed and playful. And so whenever anybody does a sing talk thing, it just like warms my heart. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm warming hearts here. It's, it's just something I, it's something I don't usually do, but yeah, singing talk. You're not a heart warmer. I totally don't. I get heart warmed from you. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm doing great today. Um, lot, I've been through a lot of change lately. I just moved from San Diego to Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. So you can see there's like still like a curtain rod back here. Like there's nothing put together yet. It's fine. Um, all good. <laughs> so we got my studio set up and, and that's all I really need for a while. So um, we have big transitions. I'm also pregnant with my first baby due in March. What? Yeah, baby girl. <laughs> so we are kind of just like in total, you know, rebirth mode, literally and figuratively. So um, I'm doing great. But yeah, it's been it's been really uprooting lately. And that's just what it is. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because you and I met at a conference back in San Diego when you used to live in San Diego. I want to say it was three years ago. It was just before COVID like shut down the entire world. Legit like six weeks before COVID. Yeah. So we got lucky. I felt like it was such a joy to, to meet you because you came to my table and I'm like, she's got a really bright light about her. She seems super confident. I always love a confident woman, but I'm like, she was just chatting it up with me and my friend who was, who were there at the conference. And I'm like, I think this is a woman I need to get to know. And luckily you were able to have me on your show. I'm having you on my show. So it's all about the connection, right? <laughs> It is. And yeah, you're right. We were so lucky to get that interaction before those, all those shutdowns. And, you know, we're still, as we're filming this kind of in the, in that space, it's a lot more open, of course, than it was last year, but you know, we're still navigating through this as a nation and as a, a planet. So um, yeah, that was a really fortunate day. And it's so fun to hear you reflect back to me, how you saw me, because that was my very first um, like, business networking thing since I had started my online business and I was quite nervous. So it's nice to hear that I was pulling it off, even though I was kind of like, what do I do here? <laughs> so I will say that you and Jenner were very like kind and introduced yourselves and that made me feel really at home. So I've, I've really been uh, benefiting from knowing both of you as well. So that's, it, it just goes to show if you ever get the opportunity to go to some kind of a learning networking event for your business or whatever it is you're passionate about, it, it always pays off. I mean, for years in the future. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned that you were nervous because I didn't get a whiff of that whatsoever <laughs> when I met you. So, and I'm sure you can talk a little bit about that when we talk about confidence, but before we jump into that, I would really love to give you a proper introduction. Great. So here it is. <laughs> Carissa Renner is an intuitive and transformational vocal coach 
who helps entrepreneurs, women, and musicians access the full power of their voice. I just felt like I wanted to have a little mermaid moment when I said that. <laughs> to create aligned marketing and music, regulate their nervous systems, which is super important these days, to access grace under fire and manifest their dreamiest lives, clients, and careers. And she does have a really wonderful vocal sounding meditation. We'll talk about that later and provide links to that. But Carissa is the creator of the Bold Vocal, if you're looking on her website. And again, I'll put links out there. Um, so Carissa, I know you had started your business when we first met. And prior to that, you were a singer. Can you tell us a little bit of how you transitioned from being a singer to offering services and vocal coaching for others? Absolutely. You know, the vocal coaching was kind of the low hanging fruit because I've had so much of it in my life. You know, I started I started singing pretty much right out of the gate, the literal birth canal. I was like. You know, my mom says when my dad used to sing to me as a like a little baby, I would cr have tears running down my face, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be upset. She was like, you weren't like crying like a baby cries. You were just like, and I think we've all had that experience of having music make us kind of tear up or very emotional. And so I guess that music has always kind of touched me even before I had language to express that. And um, it's interesting. I come from a musical family on my dad's side. Um, my grandmother was a piano teacher. My my grandfather, I think, played like boogie woogie piano, which I would love to learn. <laughs> my dad can play a little piano and he sings. And um, there's word that my dad's name and his two grandfathers, their middle names were Dorsey and his first name is Dorsey. And I haven't been able to verify this through like the ancestry things or whatever, but they say that one of my ancestors married into the Dorsey family, like Tommy Dorsey, the drum, they were jazz musicians um, and they wanted to keep the family name alive. So they put it as a middle name in one of my grandparents. So I think, you know, that side of my family comes from musicians and the other side I have, my mom was the youngest of nine kids. I have 30 grand or 30 first cousins. I'm the youngest of 31 grandchildren in one generation and none of them but me are musical so it's a really interesting thing that's like part genetics and then also part um nature nurture you know i think the the family resonance of music comes from one side and the other side is like we don't know anything we don't do music you know <laughs> so i truly believe that music can be taught singing can be taught um i definitely believe some people have a knack for it and others have to work a little harder but um i don't believe it's like a magic Thing that you have to have this talent to do it. You, I mean, it helps, but it's not, it's not a deal breaker. So anyway, I started singing very young by about eight. I was like, come on, mom, it's time for the, like, let's get serious. I have a career to manage here. You know, I was <laughs> like, can we, can we do this? So I started singing with the St. Louis Symphony Children's Choir at about eight, oh, which, okay. yeah, it was really cool. It was an amazing experience. They, it's an audition based and tuition based choir. So um, you have to audition to get in and then you also have to pay to be part of it because there's an educational component where we were learning sight singing, we were learning how to read music, we were learning um, all these amazing things. And then we would get to travel, we get to sing in the symphony hall, we get to, um, I got to sing with the Harlem Boys Choir when I was like 12, which is really cool. So that- Wow, so at eight years old, you're auditioning for mm -hmm. a major thing like this. Wow. So like what song was your audition song? Uh, at that age, it wasn't quite like that. It was more like they would play a note on the piano and see if I could sing it. Oh. Like, can you sing this note or can you clap this rhythm? And like, it was kind of a call and response thing to see like if my ear and my pitch was accurate. And I do remember them like then giving like a sequence of notes and then like making it more complicated as the audition went. And uh, so I guess I passed. <laughs> and then you had to graduate levels within there. Like um, I stayed in the children's level, I think one year and then moved up to what was called, I think, Corral. And then I was in that level for like probably three or four years before moving up to the next and the next, you know. So they evaluated you every single year and like said, OK, you're still you still belong in this this level of learning. So that was an incredible upbringing. And then by about 12, I was in private voice lessons singing kind of back then, which was in the early 90s, I guess, um, or mid 90s, early. Um, 
there wasn't any real options for singers. You could be a classical singer or a classical singer, <laughs> like, or sometimes musical theater. But as far as voice lessons at the time, it was like you were going to learn Italian arias and, and that was like what they taught. So um, I do have a background in classical. I don't teach classical or sing classical anymore, but I did that through high school. Um, my first pro singing job was when I was 15. I started, I convinced my mom, excuse me, to let me work at the Macaroni Grill, which is like a corporate <laughs> Italian chain restaurant. Yeah. Um, but it was a big deal in St. Louis, Missouri. And like, I guess that was probably around 98 or 97. Um, the St. Louis just didn't have one. And so when it opened, it was like, everybody's like, this was hot stuff. You know, everybody's <laughs> like, oh, the Macaroni Grill, it's so good. And I don't think it was until after I worked there that I realized it was um, a major corporation. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so I would sing happy birthday in Italian opera style at the tables. That's so cool. <laughs> and it was really fun. And then what would happen is I've had this kind of, I realized it as a young person too, but this like reinforced that, that I used to go to the table and start singing and all of the tables around the table I was at would just hush and it would like, all of a sudden I'd be singing, it'd be real chatty and loud because these restaurants are like high ceilings and concrete floors and tons of people and they're like noisy and all of a sudden it would just be like this hush would fall over the crowd and I remember just internalizing how powerful that was like whoa I have this power to quiet a room and then it's like what but everybody's looking at me now so I'm like okay the pressure's on but I really liked it I made a ton of cash at 15 through like 18 doing that people would tip and then I also got to practice my competition pieces because they other people will be like can you sing for our table now but we don't have a birthday I'd be like sure I'd sing something I was working on with my voice teacher and then of course I did every musical I could get into in high school and then by college I majored in jazz vocals so um and again it was kind of not because I loved jazz necessarily but because I didn't want to go into musical theater and I didn't want to be a classical singer so that was sort of the most contemporary choice and yeah and then I started singing pro in like top 40 bands and doing studio work when I was about 19 or 20 um and now I'm 38 so like really like from 15 to 38, that's pretty much the span of my paid singing career. Um, it's been amazing. I've gotten to do some incredible things and go some really cool places and meet really amazing people. And some of my best relationships have come from this. Um, but yeah, there was kind of a point, you know, a few years back, it was sort of the tower card moment. Are you, a, you're a, are you a tarot card person? Uh, I know very little about it. So. Okay. <laughs> so the tower card is in the major arcana. It's, it's like this tower on fire. It looks like a castle tower and it's just like crumbling and burning. And it's like, it's this crumbling. It's this, it's like tearing it down. So something better can be built in its place. Um, and the initial catalyst of that was when I was 28, my boyfriend died. And he was a, I know it's terrible. Um, he was a professional skydiver. He was teaching the Canadian military, like kind of their equivalent of the Navy SEALs here. He was teaching them combat jumps and night jumps and all these things that they do for tactical warfare skydiving. And it was kind of like, just like a car accident. He and another instructor collided while they were landing and they kind of, knocked each other unconscious and then fell. And so they both passed in the accident. And I was living with him at the time. We were kind of talking about getting married and having kids. We have this cute little house together and, and I loved him very deeply and getting that call, you know, it changed my life forever and, and permanently. And now I can say with some gratitude that it, it ended up building my character in such a beautiful way and, and expanding my heart in such a beautiful way. Cause I truly believe like the more darkness we experience, the more capacity we have for light. And so while I would never trade in that experience, it was absolutely a breaking point. And then I didn't deal with it for a really long time. I was like, I'm going to be really busy. I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I'm going to travel. I'm going to have this really glamorous life. I'm going to be single and date all the boys and everything is wonderful. And then I would come off the road 
and go home to an empty bedroom and to a very sad existence. And so that over time kind of led to a lot of substance abuse, um, a lot of just not taking very good care of myself, depression, anxiety. And that all eventually culminated in this moment when the bold vocal kind of came about, which is I came to an understanding that if nothing changed, that I would end up an addict or dead or just miserable forever. <laughs> and at some point I, you know, really started to to do the work. I went to therapy. I started listening to um, uplifting inspirational content on podcasts. I started reading personal development books and going, what, what needs to be healed? What am I holding on to? And then realizing that a lot of the stuff that led me to the situation of dating a skydiver who eventually died came from way before that, you know, mm -hmm. and I went way back into my life. And so the bold vocal really came about. There was a little bit of an intuitive download. And may I cuss on this show? I don't know if you guys sure, go for it. <laughs> I won't do it a lot. But this was the exact words that I heard was like, heal the fucking world. And it was like, everybody can let go of these burdens. Everybody can can get back to their core truth, no mm -hmm. matter what they've been through. And so the vocal coaching I knew I wanted like a heart forward business that was of service, that was helping people. Um, and the vocal element of it really was, like I said, sort of the low hanging fruit. It's what I knew and I knew how to teach it. Um, and I knew I wanted the freedom of my own business and all that. Oh, pups. Yeah, my pup is so loud. <laughs> oh, I love it. We have very vocal dogs here too, but they're in the other room right now. Uh, they may still be here at some point. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it was sort of this like moment of just like, I've had enough. I'm done with the anxiety. I'm done with the depression. I'm done working for other people. I'm done being poor. I'm done living paycheck to paycheck. I'm done being drunk at a club at 3 a.m., you know, and all of that at the same kind of time led to this coaching experience. <clears throat> and at first I was only working with singers. I still work with singers. I love, love working with singers. But as my own spiritual and personal growth continued, I realized that like that was really at the core of what I did, even with singers is like, I want self-expression and love and that those core truths and those core values and, and the freedom that I found through my own business to be available to anyone who wants it. And so then I started coaching um, more in that personal development space using the voice as my tool. Interesting. Interesting. And I know you have a lot of different techniques that you use and you borrow from the singing world, but you also bring in some other intuitive practices, like you just mentioned tarot and some other things that you do within your Facebook group. And I'll put all those links below this video. So if you guys want to connect with Carissa, check out the comments in this video. She's on Instagram. She's got a group on Facebook. Um, she's great. So hang out in her space. But what would you say um, is a really important or powerful technique that speakers or business owners or entrepreneurs or coaches could borrow from singers? Oh, breath, <laughs> breath, <laughs> breath, breath, breath and resonance. Um, you know, breath, I think the, one of the phrases I use very often and I swear by is the quality of your voice depends on the quality of your breath. So if you're speaking when we're nervous or, um, you know, stressed if you're and, and stress is not always a bad thing by the way like you know we're going to talk about the nervous system a little bit at some point if your nervous system is in that fight flight activation it's not always a bad thing like if you're a speaker and you're on a stage or you're in a sales pitch if you're an entrepreneur you want that engaged because that is your fire that's your energy like that's that's that what you bring right so it's not necessarily always bad. It's bad when you're trying to chill and like you're triggered, right? It's it's bad when you're trying to sleep and your mind is going a million miles an hour. It's good when you're showing up on stage and you want that what you, how whatever you said at the beginning, like that light, that that vibrancy. It's good to have that. Um so the breath is a really important check-in though, because you'll even hear me in the middle of interviews, maybe I'll do it today. I can catch when my energy is getting up here and I'm like, whoa, 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 blah, 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 and I have to go, let me ground a second. Let me take a breath. Because when we get into that state, we tend to start breathing from the chest up, very shallow breaths. And that actually exacerbates the fight or flight response. It's, it's feeding into that. 
Um, it's also, if you guys want to get kind of, um, let's say, I don't know what, I don't want to give it a word cause I don't want to judge it, but like in sex, you know, if, if you're trying to enjoy sex and become present, the breath, you want it to be very slow and deep and start to really tune into the body and deregulate, like come out of that, like unsafe feeling and like really ground in and be safe. But as you approach climax, the breath also becomes shallow because that's when the body switches in to that excited, fired up state. So like the state of orgasm is a shallow, quick breath and the state of like softening into a sexual act and safety with your partner or yourself is in those slow, deep breaths. So as far as it goes for speakers, entrepreneurs, etc., when you're a little nervous, sales pitches, Facebook lives, uh, speaking on a stage, whatever it is that you do, your breath will tend to get pretty shallow and quick. And that can easily escalate into a voice that sounds edgy, thin, wobbly. Um, Mm -hmm. You know how you can tell if someone's about to cry when they speak? It's like a tone that's very easily recognizable. The, The voice is a dead giveaway of the state of your nervous system. So as a speaker, the most important thing that you can possibly do is to take a deep breath before you speak, in the middle of speaking. Don't be afraid to let that white space be there. A lot of people, when they feel that light on them, when they feel that nakedness that comes with being on stage, or in front of people's eyes. It's like a white, hot, searing uncomfortability, uncomfortableness. I don't know if that's a word. Discomfort. Um, discomfort. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So it's like they want it, they want out of it so quickly that they start to rush and they start to mm-hmm. and then it's like everything is very frenetic. So like putting your hands by your side, letting your palms be open and soft. You know, mm-hmm. not none of this, none of this, none of just like like you're holding heavy grocery bags in each side by your by your thighs. Just I mean, without actually gripping, but <laughs> just that you can feel the weight of gravity in your fingertips. It pulls your shoulders out of your ears. You pause, deep breath in through your nose. Hi, my name is Carissa Lynn Renner. I'm so excited to be here with you today. We're going to talk about the voice and how powerful it is in your business. And you see my whole energy shifted in the, in the presence of that breath. And then it's also this beautiful way to make a point. So when you're escalating into these big, amazing spaces in your talk and you're like, this is what it's about. Like, this is the point that you need to hear. This is what's going to make you the money. And it's always been there. Hmm. So this breath has the way of also creating emphasis where you can bring the voice to a a smaller tone, a more intimate tone where you really land a point, where you really land your message. And if you don't remember to stop and take those breaths, often your voice will reflect your nerves and your message might get a bit lost in the process. Oh, I love that you say that. And I I have a similar experience to you. I've been told when I'm presenting, after presenting for so long, you get used to it and you fall into your comfort zone and things like that. So people will be like, I feel you up here. I don't feel you down here, which is a no-no for a speaker. Like you have to connect emotionally with your people. So I was like, oh, I need to work on that. So I'm going to definitely utilize these breath techniques and, and just be more cognizant. And I'm always telling my clients, use the pause people like Mm -hmm. take a breath ground yourself just be quiet so your audience can catch up with you but so you can catch up with your own energy as well because you can't connect if you're rushing to the next thing or if your voice is all over the place sometimes that works but sometimes it's um it's nervousness or it's other things showing up and i love that you said the voice is a dead giveaway for the state of the nervous system because i've certainly experienced that and heard that and clients. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm just curious because, you know, I'm really not a fan of the Kardashians and all that stuff, but there's this whole vocal fry thing, right? <laughs> like, oh, oh my God. And you look like that scratchy, irritating tone in voice. Like um, what's going on there? And like, if you gravitate towards that, what can you do to get away from that? Awesome. This is a wonderful question. 
Vocal fry technically is a vocal register. So registration has to do with like where the voice is being resonated and the the state of the vocal cords. Like, are they thick? Are they thin? Are they compressed? Are they floppy? So um, that's essentially what vocal registration is. And when, if you're not sure what that means, you may have heard terms like chest voice or head voice or belting or mixed voice. These are all registers. Um, Technically, vocal fry is a vocal register, and it is not inherently in itself bad. Um, it's not damaging unless you're really overdoing it. It's not um, kind of not annoying unless you're really overdoing it. Um, it is an under-energized vocal tone, so basically not enough volume, not enough breath flow, and maybe not enough pitch. Like the pitch is kind of low, but it's just like low energy. It's like if you're just, sometimes I start to talk like this when I'm tired. Uh, I just <laughs> want to go to bed or uh, it's kind of whiny, but it's just, I'm just not pressing enough air through my vocal cords to, cords to get a clean, clean tone. So it's effective in some ways. Let's talk about the positives before the negatives, because I think a lot of people know the negatives of it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a well-documented thing that it can cause you not to get jobs. It can. Um, I have turned off speakers that I'd love to hear their message, that I can't stand their voice. And right. I hate to say that I'm that person, but I am. So um, uh, let's talk about the positives of it. So first of all, vocal fry can fix a breathy voice. So if you're somebody who naturally is kind of has this breathiness to your tone and this translates as weakness, by the way, it's sometimes mm. sweet and it can be, again, it can be used. And did you see, I even cleaned up my tone. It's hard for me to maintain a breathy tone and a breathy tone, by the way, is almost just as bad consistently as a vocal fry consistently. It's like if somebody held open your eye and blew air into it, breath passing over the vocal cords, it dries them out. Um, so mm. it's, it's essentially not healthy either to speak breathy all the time. But for example, uh, maybe yoga teachers or meditation teachers might try to get their point across of peace and joy and love and unity by using a breathy tone. But what's really more powerful is to use a quieter voice with more compression and say, take a moment in your body. This is much more powerful than take a moment in your body. And sometimes, again, it's okay to, these are all, I like to think of the voice as a color palette, like an artist. They're all shades. They all belong. Nothing is a demonized thing, like even vocal fry. It's not a bad thing in its own nature. It's just a color you use from. And it's like, it, let's call it black, right? And it's like, it's like if your artist is just using black all the time, I don't know, actually, that could be cool. It's, <laughs> that's not a great analogy. But like, it's just, it's like a monochromatic thing. Like there's no contrast, there's no variance. And it, and it does kind of wear on the ear, much like a similar aesthetic if everything was white everywhere it would wear on the eye you know those pops of color are what give it contrast and interest you know so um creating vocal fry at the beginning or the onset of your speech tone can help you come across as more powerful because women especially uh we want to be taken seriously we've, we've been gaslit for I don't know, centuries, and we have been disempowered and not listened to. Our voices have been disregarded for a very long time. Um, as soon as basically patriarchal society came around, women women's voices were subdued and um, considered inferior. So often, and I think this um, is off a result of the, you know, the women in the workforce revolution, like all the the high powered CEO females that came through in the eighties and their pantsuits and their shoulder pads. When we get into a place where we want to feel like people are taking us seriously, especially in a room that has men in it, we tend to lower our voices and we speak very low and like, this is how we think we get authority. And that mm. often ends in vocal fry. Now this is not the Kardashian kind. This is the, I am not a woman. Don't listen to my womanly voice. I am just as manly as you. And I deserve to be heard. Kardashian voice is a different thing. We'll talk about in a sec. But <laughs> so many women, 
try to achieve power in their voices through lowering pitch, which is not necessarily healthy. My speaking voice lives in this part of my body. If I start speaking down here, I might sound more boomy, but it's kind of inauthentic and it's not super healthy. So if you're someone who speaks all day on Zoom calls, on phone calls, on stages, eventually if you're talking with this low boomy voice to try to achieve power, you will you'll fatigue your voice, you'll end up scratchy throat, tired, hoarse. So the answer is like, if you want to not sound so girly and feminine, is some of the breathiness needs to come away from the voice. And this is where vocal fry, you can't have breathiness and fry at the same time because fry is the vocal cords coming together and breathiness is the vocal cords apart. Oh. Versus ah. So let's try that. Say, um, say, Hi, in a very nice, light, breathy tone. Hi. 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 <laughs> it's so fun. Okay, now I want you to say, I. I. Yeah, and that's a little exaggerated, but you get the difference, right? You're feeling yeah. one's breathy, aspirated. The other is closed, um, vocal fry onset. And in general, what you want as a speaker or a singer is a balanced onset. It's some, it's somewhere right in the middle of those two. So it's not I, but I, I. I. So you can hear that little bit of uh, at the beginning, I, but it's not I. It's not that <laughs> wine, you know. Um, but it's also not I. I'd love to go to the store. I'd love to see you today. Right? So I just want to practice doing breathy, breathy voice all day long now. This is so fun. <laughs> it's really fun. It's really fun. So, yeah, if you're someone who's trying to achieve power in your voice and you want more presence in your voice and you want people to take you seriously as a business person, especially a business person who identifies as feminine, it's not about lowering the tone. It's often about putting a little bit of vocal fry at the beginning, the Interesting. beginning of your words. I am from Missouri, not I am from Missouri. <laughs> Those okay. are, you know what I mean? Yes. Now, Kardashian speak is vocal fry at the end. Uh, oh, my God. And then often it's got up speak, too. Yes. What are you doing? Oh, my God. Where's my <laughs> lipstick? It goes up in a question mark, even though there's no question mark. Well, where's my lipstick, Haslin? What are you doing, Des, too? It's hard to, it's hard to do. Let's see. My name is Kim. I'm Kim. <laughs> like, like uh, it sounds like a question, but it's a statement. So upspeak and vocal fry combined um, are definitely a generational thing. Um, our parents and grandparents did not speak like that, even in Southern California. I think, you know, this is kind of an offshoot of the Valley Girl accent from the 70s and 80s, you know. Um, and I think part of the culture in Southern California is to be really laid back and cool and easygoing. And so this like kind of lazy speech, it's like, that's how we let everyone know that we're cool. And we're just don't really care that much. Everything's good. You know, so <laughs> I know if I had to listen to that at the beginning of any extended amount of wording, I would be like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> like, peace mm -hmm. out, people. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. So it, it's definitely, and I think if we were younger, we may not be as, uh, it may not sound as abrasive to us. Like, oh. if you were mm -hmm. in the Kylie and, and Kendall generation, which I'm not. Um, <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> then that may be a little bit more normal to your ear. Mm. But it sounds a little foreign. Now, there are some real professional setbacks to using too much vocal fry in your speech. For example, I am not of the corporate world, but I am aware of a thing where um, when you apply to major corporations, often there is a voice screening app. It's a bot. It's a computer. It's not a person listening to you. And you introduce yourself and it, it looks for upspeak vocal fry and things Ooh. like that. And it automatically filters you out of your resume ever getting to the person that it's supposed to reach. It's it's a filtration system because of oh how, wow yeah because of how many applicants big big companies may get for one position. Um, there is actually a software that will just say because you know when we go back to talking about living in daddy's big corporate boss world, um, men middle aged white men in particular hate vocal fry. <laughs> 
they just don't like it. So <laughs> um, those are generally the bosses, unfortunately, in the world, that's still pretty true. And so this is um, one of those things that just filters out people's applications and narrows down the hiring process before these people ever have to put in time or energy into mm. looking into these things. So there is a lot to be said. And like same, if you're doing phone interviews or Zoom interviews, like these learning to speak professionally in a voice that has a balanced onset because vocal fry sometimes works. I'm not really sure that's right for me. Like it's okay to do it here and there. It makes sense. Yeah. It actually communicates in a way. So that's my answer to that big question. It's, it can be damaging when you overdo it. Uh, if you just did that all the time, it kind of is just like grading your chords together. But like I said, it can also be just as bad to be breathy all the time. Yeah. So really it's, it's a lot about balance. It's about pulling those, all those colors together in a balanced palette. Yeah. And I love how you compare the sound to a visualization, the colors of how it comes across. And variety is definitely one of the things when I'm working with speaking clients, like, are you a monotone as you're speaking? How are you going to create some interest for your audience? You have to create some modulation, whether that's pitch resonance or anything else, or how you're saying certain things or how you're moving into your audience. So there's many techniques you can use both vocal and otherwise. So I love that you brought that up, that if you begin with vocal fry, it might be more effective as a woman in a man's world than it would be if you ended or had that high inflection at the end, which I hear a lot of women do that, where they're like, I don't know, what do you want to do? And it's just like, oh, no, that, no, have some you know confidence in what you're saying. I do have one more question for you, Krissa, and then you can share some of your beautiful work that you're sharing with us today. Great. But what is the connection for you between singing or your voice and confidence? Yeah. Well, it's everything, right? Your voice, uh, I think, like we said, it's kind of a mirror of your confidence. It's a it's a portrayal of your confidence. And that is often having to do with the state of your nervous system because confident people, like we talked about right in the beginning of our chat, aren't necessarily inwardly feeling entirely confident. It's an outward expression of vibrancy. It's an outward expression of self-assuredness. It's a, it's, it's a posture. It's a, it's a radiation. It's a, it comes from within. And the voice is the outer voice. The speaking voice is kind of that barometer, like we talked about, but the inner voice is where it starts. So this is where that personal development work really crosses beautifully into vocalization, be it through singing or speaking or sounding, which is something else. Well, what I'm going to give you as a gift is more sounding. It's not speaking or singing, just making sound. Um, the inner voice is where it starts, because if in your voice, in your head, this little voice up here is saying, you're going to mess this up. They're going to hate you. Oh my God. Why did you even think you could do this? You know, what, what, where do you get off thinking that you, whatever, like these little negative Nancy's up here, that inner voice is where confidence begins. Because if mm -hmm. the inner voice is berating you, and I think that's a really common thing, right? Like you, we've all experienced that. If that inner voice is berating you, the voice will reflect it outwardly because like, think about this. Okay. So what does a guitar get played with? How do you play a guitar, right? With your hands, mm -hmm. right? How do you play drums, hands and feet and core muscles? <laughs> How do you play piano, fingers, hands, right? And of course the brain in all of this, but how do you play a vocal instrument? Your diaphragm. Well, yeah, so absolutely. <laughs> Diaphragm's controlling the breath. And that's one of the three systems of singing that like create sound as a, a song tone versus speaking. But like all of that initiates here, right? Mm -hmm. And the vocal cords, the only way I can control it, like for example, if I want to play higher on my piano, my right hand moves more to the right. If I want to play higher on my guitar, my left hand moves up the fretboard. If I want to sing higher with my voice, I have to create a physiological condition in my body where my cricothyroid muscle contracts and pulls my vocal pulls my larynx forward and down and thins out my vocal cords like rubber bands so that they get tighter and thinner and then they can vibrate more quickly for a higher pitch so all mm -hmm. of this is done here and when you're singing you're not like let's engage that ct muscle shall we 
You know, that's, <laughs> it's, it's what we call a peripheral awareness. Like I can teach you how to do that by saying like, okay, we're going to go, Ooh, or we're going to go like, um, I can make you do sounds that create that condition in the voice, but I can't just ask you like, Hey Jen, can you engage your thyroretinoid muscle? And you're like, I'd be like, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I can't. Like, no, I really can't. So, um, yeah. So what's happening in your mind is really dictating what's happening in your voice. So a lot of singing is like tricking the body into doing what you want. So for example, when we talk about singing and mixing mixed voices, sort of like the the holy grail of contemporary singing. It's like that really powerful high vocal that like, you know, the pop divas have and you're like, how does she hit those notes with such power? It's so high. It's usually a, a really strong mixed voice, which means both low and voice are engaged at the same time. And it, it's an elusive setting in the voice. It's one that most vocal clients, that's what they're looking for. It's like where your voice breaks. It's like, how do I get out of that break and get to this power? So one of the ways to get there is to have people speak like Minnie Mouse, like, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you today. Or like if you're from Fargo, oh, my, oh, hello. These types of sounds are mixing. And you can see my cheekbones are popping out. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can see that I'm smiling a bit. And my eyebrows are raised and I've got a bit of a upturned mouth. You can see my top teeth when I do this. Hello, oh. hi. This is engaging. Um the mask this is putting sound here and it's bringing my overtones into a brighter space so this shape of the face this kind of voice if i can get you to do it speaking i can get you to do it singing but when we go to singing our brains are automatically like singing this is serious have to do it right cannot mess up can't look bad can't sound bad they're gonna hate me and then you go like oh oh and you like get real serious so um, this is a tangent and I can't remember the point, which <laughs> I think the point so it was about is how singing and the voice is connected to confidence. And what I'm hearing from you is that your inner voice is where confidence begins, but there are right. ways you can manipulate the muscles within your face and where you project your voice from to get that confidence and to access different parts of your voice Absolutely. so that you can uh, do things that you haven't been able to do before. Right. And absolutely. It's like that. So the, the idea is like when what I was just talking about, when you're thinking about singing, it sets this mode. It's very serious. The It's tense. It's fearful. But when you're playing, when you're talking like Minnie Mouse or Barbara Streisand or when we're meowing like a cat, all those defenses kind of come down. And so what's happening here mentally is affecting what you're able to do with your voice. And the same is very much true just on a day-to-day -day level. How do you speak to yourself? What do you say when you pass by a mirror to yourself? What, um, what do you believe about yourself? These things come through in the voice. And if you want to be confident, you've got to be really diligent about what that voice is saying to you because the voice, the mind controls the voice. And the voice is the reflection of confidence, right? I love it. Yeah. I love it. And that was a good description of how that kind of works together. It's a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Um, I've had so much fun today, Krista. Thank you for the demo, the voice demos too. Oh my God, that was so fun. And we have to replay <laughs> that and listen to all of that. Um, I do want you to get a chance to share with us more about the guided vocal sounding meditation, the free gift you're sharing with us. Give us a little teaser on what we can expect. Good, good, good. Okay, so this is my woo side coming forward. And I actually don't even love the term woo anymore because I think it should be just normalized and not like it's it's out there crazy. Um, it is a working through the energetic centers of your body. Some people call them chakras. Other people prefer just to call them energy centers. If you're not familiar, there is a document that comes with the download that explains what each one is, where it's located, what it does, what it's associated with. And um, it's kind of like vocal Tai Chi. So what we're going to do in there is there are some hand motions and some sounds that go together to align all these energy centers from the crown of your head to the tip of your tailbone or your chakra system. And this can help you in your manifestations. If you have a block somewhere in that system, your manifestations are going to get stuck there. Um, if you are just feeling kind of dumpy and grumpy, this is a really beautiful way to shift energy. There are three really effective and quick ways to shift energy, which are breath, movement, and sound. And this 
is all three. So this is like a supercharged moving sounding meditation that can like, it's like maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes or so I would have to look, but it's like, if you are just having a day and you want to get back to your core truth, your happiness, that light, buzzy feeling in your body, um, seeing the world through a higher perspective rather than those earthly problems, uh, this is going to be an amazing thing for you. And it's really going to help you also learn to take up some space with your voice. It's um, some people just are really confronted by the idea of being heard and, and making sound at all. And these sounds are kind of goofy. They're like, oh, uh, and like, ee. so there's like lots of kind of sounds maybe you've never tried before. And I think working through that discomfort is a really big part of that external confidence. Like, oh, that I'm okay. I got through that. This is fun. This is good. I feel great. Uh, so that's what that is. And I love sharing this work with people. It's definitely, um, I think it's one of the unique tools that I use amongst lots of other tools that a lot of coaches use. But I think this is one I bring to the table that's pretty pretty specific to the voice. Awesome. And I love it. And in fact, when you think about what you talked about, about using your breath and grounding yourself before you're speaking or singing, whatever your case happens to be, the energy can't move through your body. You can't ground properly if there's a blockage in one of your energy centers. So I think this is a perfect gift for people to kind of give themselves permission to be a little playful, a little bit different and access different parts of your voice that maybe your instrument, shall we say, that we're not used to utilizing or playing with. So I encourage everyone to take a look at this free resource. Carissa has been sharing it with us and utilize some of the techniques and the warm ups she talked about today, because this is going to be a beautiful transformation, not just for your confidence, but also for your technique. And I'm all about technique. So, well, I do want to share that um, I will be continuing to offer guest expert series. Thank you so much, Carissa, for being our final guest expert for this part of the year. I'm going to be continuing to do guest expert series, but only with my current coaching clients. So if you're someone who wants to be more confident, wants to speak, wants to do more live streams, more podcast interviews, and you just need a little help to get you there to figure out what you need to say, how you need to say it, I'm your gal, and part of the benefit of working with me is I will feature you on my audience. So my Facebook page, my YouTube channel, if you don't have a platform, this is your opportunity to be on someone else's platform, which is one of the best places to be. Um, when you're growing your business, you may not have the bigger numbers. I'm not huge. I'm not a huge influencer or anything like that, but I can certainly share your work in this world. So thank you once more, Carissa, for joining us this Friday morning. The replay will be up. If you're catching us right now, the replay will be going on for the rest of the weekend before I'll take it down. So make sure to take Carissa, ask your questions, share with us your biggest takeaway. I can't wait to hear what all of you did for your vocal exercises. <laughs> anything else you'd like to leave us with, Carissa? No, just, um, you know, just that. I really hope everyone had that connection to do something to say yes when you mean yes, no when you mean no. This this boundary, the the vocal chakra and the vo voice controls boundaries. It controls your relationships, your happiness, your your people pleasing. All of that is much within your power. So um, I think mean what you say and say what you mean, and you will get very far in this life. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the other side of the replay. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.